welcome back to Brilliant Fishing. I'm Jason Brilliant, your host, and today I'm here with somewhat of a local celebrity. Uh, some of you know him as Tony Sharon. Some of you know him as the Shadnator. Uh, some of you know him as Officer Sharon, or maybe just the guy that hangs out down at Hills Minnow Farm. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> we're excited today to have uh, Tony with us today. Uh, he uh, does a lot of things fishing related. I'm gonna let you t let him tell you a little bit about that. Uh, but he's a guy you want to check in with if you're fishing anywhere on the Yadkin chain of lakes. Now it's High Rock, Tucker Town, uh, and some of those. So uh, uh, not to oversell it, he's <laughs> but he's a, somewhat of a fishing genius. And so we're gonna <laughs> I think I'm stretching it a little bit there. <laughs> but we're gonna pick his brain today on uh, some some different topics uh, related to fishing. You know, High Rock and Tucker Town and so forth. But uh, before we do that, just want to give Tony opportunity to tell us a little bit about about himself like how i got to doing what he does now and um you know a little bit about you know what it, what it is that he spends his time doing now well i uh come to this area in 1992 in 1988 i was hired by the north carolina wildlife commission as a law enforcement officer a game warden and i came to rowan county in a permanent position in around ni 1992 and my primary area of responsibility was high rock lake tuckertown lake and then various parts of the yakin river chain uh, throughout my early career as a field officer, I, part of my job was to be able to out on the lake and I, I become very knowledgeable with the whole area. You know, back then, way before G, a lot of GPS and all this kind of stuff, you know, you marked your fishing spot by a tree or a rock or triangulated mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would come up and being a fisherman, I always paid attention to what the guys were doing because, you know, I got to see the secret bait and I got to see what they were catching because I looked in their coolers. So <laughs> it was not unusual for me to come back and fish in the secret spot. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, I had a, I had a 30 year career with the wildlife commission. It was a great job. Enjoyed it. Met thousands and thousands of people. Uh, most interactions were great. All, uh, of course, in law enforcement, some are not so great. Sure. And uh, um, but most people are gracious, and a lot of people are good people. And you always, if you're a fisherman or hunter, and you meet someone that's into that, you immediately have something to talk about. Mm -hmm. And sure. I tend to talk quite a bit about fishing and so forth. <laughs> so when I, my career ended, I retired uh, after 30 years. About it's been six and a half years now. Um, my main job now is to hopefully make my wife smile, <laughs> I mow the grass about once a week, and I go to the lake and fish as much as I can. And mm -hmm. I live three miles from High Rock. Mm -hmm. So High Rock and Tucker Town are, I'm, I know every nook and cranny of those mm -hmm. two lakes, mm -hmm. but I fish, uh, I fish Baden, Tillery, Little Falls Lake, mm -hmm. uh, and then the Yakin River. Um, not much further than Boone's Cave anymore. I'm not as brave as I used to be. Right. <laughs> Run the river in that shallow water. There. Okay. Well, good. Well, well, what I was hoping today is maybe we'd spend a couple minutes just talk about some of the uh, springtime mm -hmm. fishing opportunities that exist out here, you know, on some of these lakes. So what's out there for anglers to target right now? Okay. Well, in, on the Yakin chain, um, right now, March is just everything starts turning on so on the yakin river itself when i when i talk about yakin river i'm referring to say i-85 north uh, as far as boone's cave uh the the high rock lake is still considered a lake well above the uh the where the south yakin and yakin join mm -hmm. and uh, it's still affected by the lake levels up mm -hmm. that far and uh, in March, uh, white bass become very active on the river, mm -hmm. as does a few stripers. Stripers aren't as prevalent as they once were, but they're still around, and they do run up the river all the way to Idles Dam up in Forsyth mm -hmm. County, which okay. is a, a long ways. And mm -hmm. uh, so there's a there's a few uh, guys that fish the river that still catch some stripers here and there, but the white bass is probably what I target the most in March. Mm -hmm. And I hit Little Creek Mouse, uh, Sandy Points, mm -hmm just sort of drift and cast the shoreline. And mm -hmm. uh, if you time it right, water needs to be clear. If it's muddy, you're not gonna do very well. But when mm -hmm. the water's clear, starting right now through the rest of the month, it can be really mm -hmm. good and a lot of fun. Okay, so so what do you use, let's say you're going after these these white bass, I mean, what kind of tactics do you like to? Well, I do a lot of uh, drifting the shoreline, casting the shoreline. I'll use uh, small uh, shad body, plastic shad bodies mm -hmm. in white and pearl. 
uh, mm -hmm. rooster tails work well, uh, small mm -hmm. crank baits, anything that looks like a shad, okay. but not too big. You know, you need to okay. downsize your bait to uh, three inch stuff generally. Okay. Uh, crappy jigs will work, but I usually do a little better with say three inch stuff, two, mm -hmm. two to three inch uh, soft mm -hmm. plastics. Hmm. in uh, mostly shad colors white and shad and anything with spinning blades work really good mm -hmm. sometimes um, but if you'll focus on any kind of creek mouth that's coming into the, a river on the Yakin River um, those are prime places to be mm -hmm. uh, for the white bass because they will run up in these small streams and, and tributaries mm -hmm. okay so uh, so white bass um, this is definitely a springtime thing mm -hmm. um, so we talked a little bit about crappie. Yeah, the crappie. Um, so March is great for the white bass. You move on down into high rock and you still catch white bass, but the crappie become more, uh, they're starting to move into the shallow waters and mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a host of places, but high rock is a shallow lake to begin with. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a large part of it's not over 25 feet deep. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have the lower end of the lake, which is a little deeper. But all the shallow coves, uh, you can, one of the easiest methods to find them is use a cork and a jig. Mm -hmm. And you just go to the uh, shoreline back of a cove and you just cast and do a slow retrieve mm -hmm. with the cork and jig. Usually uh, anywhere from 12 inches to 24 inches deep mm -hmm. and you don't have to do a lot of jigging and shaking you can just do a very really slow retrieve and it mm -hmm. seems to work really good mm -hmm. so crappy just all through the month of, of march especially into april is mm -hmm. it's on fire on high rock lake mm -hmm. and tucker town also i mean mm -hmm. same same type of technique on both mm -hmm. lakes work well they move shallow it's not unusual catch you know 50 60 in one spot because mm -hmm. there's just so many moved up now water levels rise and fall a lot um, on high rock so just because there was five feet deep uh, in this cove last week mm -hmm. it may have dropped three feet by the end of the next week mm -hmm. so you have to keep track of uh, water levels sometimes right. after Memorial Day it stays within about four foot of full most of the time mm -hmm. through the summer till Labor Day mm, that's good so the other things talking about the crappie would be uh, the various tributaries on High Rock Lake. So okay. primary tr tributaries are Swearin Creek in Davidson County, mm -hmm. and then you have Crow Creek. I'm going I'm going downstream from there. So okay. you got Swearin Creek, and then you have um, let's see, Swearin Crow Creek is the next one. It's a very long narrow cove, and then you have Duck Cove, mm -hmm. and then you go down to Abbotts Creek. Yeah. Then you go down to Flat Swamp. Mm -hmm. Now, when High Rock is really muddy, Flat Swamp's probably the clearest of all the all mm -hmm. the creeks on the lake, on average. Mm -hmm. But you know, dirty water don't mean you won't catch fish. Now, it's not my preferred method, but the guys that are really good with live scoping and know what mm -hmm. they're doing, they love dingy, dirty water. Right. And I think it's because they can sneak up on the fish a little closer right. and you know drop it on their nose. Now, my style of fishing, I tend to cast more. Okay. Uh, I troll a little bit, but I, I like to cast. I fish a lot of brush piles. Okay. So after the spawn happens, mm -hmm. um, and you go into May, for about the second week of May, mm -hmm. the fish will move off the shallows and start hitting the, the deep water brush. Okay. And uh, I've literally found thousands of deep water brush uh, throughout the river chain. I mean, I think I'm over 2,000 now. Oh, wow. And I didn't put them out there, but I used a live scope, and mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time with the trolling motors, mm -hmm. easing along, scanning with my live scope. Mm -hmm. And I mark, when I see a good brush pile, I mark it. Yeah. And then, it, so basically I can go anywhere on high rock and okay. there's a brush pile somewhere mm -hmm. that I found at some point. Hmm. And the summertime, so May, June, and July, and well, really May through, we'll say, uh, till September, um, brush pile fishing is the way That's to go. The game. That's the game on, on mm -hmm. all the yak and chain lakes. Mm -hmm. And I, I jump from lake to lake. I'll mm -hmm. hit high rock. If I want to catch consistently bigger fish for mm -hmm. me, I go to Baden. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to catch bigger fish at Baden okay. and, and deeper. Mm -hmm. um, high rock's three miles from my house, so it's an easy place to go. I can mm -hmm. go and in one cove. One day I went and found 60 brush piles oh, wow. in one in about an hour and a half mm -hmm. so there's <laughs> unlimited places to go try right and with the live scope you know i pull up i can sort of scan a brush if there's four or five fish on it i'll just move to a different one and find mm -hmm. one that's loaded and there always are some that are loaded mm -hmm. so through the summer uh the brush pile fishing 
uh, you can use minnows. I use jigs most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's just phenomenal mm -hmm. on all all of the lakes on the chain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, white bass super good in um, April May, mm -hmm. uh, especially May on High Rock. They'll start coming up chasing small gizzard shad mm -hmm. schools, and you can go to the mouth of any of the main tributaries, especially Dutch, Se Dutch Second Creek, and down in the Black Bottoms uh, mm -hmm. toward Panther Creek area. Hmm. Um, on the row end side, they tend to come up on the surface. Um, but I think because high rocks stay stained a lot, the sur surface activity tends to be a little broken compared to say, uh, Baden Lake, mm -hmm. where Baden Lake, I've seen acres of fish come up because mm -hmm. the water's really clear, but mm -hmm. high rock is so dingy, I don't think they mm -hmm. see the bait as easy, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, since we're talking about crappy fishing, let me throw this in the mix and ask you about this. You know, the the Wildlife Resource Commission here a few years ago decided to take the limit, at least for the Yadkin chain, just mm -hmm. the you know the eight inch limit and the max of twenty right. fish, mm -hmm. take that off. Uh, do you do you have thoughts on how that's maybe affected the the, the fishing? Well, from what I've seen, now I was a law enforcement officer, a game warden when that rule first become come into effect, and I was I was party to some of the meetings that we had beforehand when they talked about it. And back then, the biologists were actually split about half and half. Mm -hmm. Part thought it was a good idea, the other part thought, well, not such a good idea because mm -hmm. there were concerns that they would overpopulate. Mm -hmm. Well, High Rock, Yakin River chain is known for having a high food base. It's mm -hmm. a very fertile lake for a lots of reasons, a lot of nutrient rich. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can't, anywhere you go on High Rock, you'll see shad and mm -hmm. they're at the base of the food chain a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, so we, the Wildlife Commission, uh, implemented this, this regulation, and we vigorously enforced it, as many people can attest <laughs> to. I was very effective at doing my job <laughs> at that time. However, you know, um, over time, what I seen personally was, you know, you could go out and catch 100 150 crappy, but mm -hmm. you'd only have 10 or 15 that were eight inches or better. Mm -hmm. And it just progressively got worse. And the surveys mm -hmm. that the biologists were doing were coming up where they had piles of smaller fish, but not as many bigger fish. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, the, the removal of the size limit that happened about, it's been about six to seven years ago, mm -hmm. um, almost seven years ago, I guess, when they removed it. I've seen a benefit personally. Mm -hmm. I've seen bigger catches. I personally catch bigger fish, mm -hmm. whether it's because a lot of the small ones have been removed and you can actually get to the big ones now. <laughs> right. I, don't, I don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, however, across the board in High Rock Lake and Tuckertown, I've seen better catches from many, many people. Mm -hmm. Back then, I knew of one four pound crappy that come out of high rock mm -hmm. and it had been a few years before mm -hmm. this was back in the 90s and now every year there's multiple over three pound crappy mm -hmm. and several that hit four pounds every year now mm -hmm. and that was not happening before right yeah and i don't think it was just the advent of social media so that we would you know, like, <laughs> so that we knew about it. And yeah. I just think now, I think just people were just catching bigger fish. Yeah, I mean, we always had the, you know, you, the fish tales that people would tell. <laughs> and, you know, they somebody would have a right. picture, you know, a Polaroid right. of what this fish or that fish, yeah. and you heard stories about them. Mm -hmm. Now, the social media lets us actually see the, the fish picture because mm -hmm. everybody likes to post their pictures. Right. And But my experience personally fishing, I personally catch way more mm -hmm. bigger fish now. Yeah. And it's not because necessarily I'm using the live scope. I was already catching them before mm -hmm. I got the live scope, but i quickly seen just the increase in, yeah. to me, the overall right. size. So I, I'm a I'm a strong supporter of the size limit being removed and mm -hmm. the krill limit being removed. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point in time, it may be revisited. When I say revisited, the Wildlife Commission will look at it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I support when the biologists say, hey, we need to do this because there's a biological reason for mm -hmm. it, I'm all for that. Sure. I'm not so much for social political reasons, sure. you know, and that yeah. that plays into things too a, a lot mm -hmm. of times. Mm -hmm. So you know, as long as it's a biological reason, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I support it 100. percent Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, good, and I think you know, and I had um, Casey on the other day when mm -hmm. we were talking about you know striped bass and the F ones in Lake Norman right. and all this kind of stuff. And one of the things she said made a lot of sense is you know sometimes we just got to try it. We yeah. got to try it. We're gonna see if it works. If it doesn't work, 
we don't have to keep doing it. That's I mean, right. so and so I, you know, I think just having an open open mind and being willing to look at like, well, what does the biology tell us, and then you know, not be so. <laughs> committed to our decision that we can't change our minds if we see that something is or isn't working i think that's important i think that's a good viewpoint to take um and i agree i agree with that definitely um i never understood for many years the wildlife commission at the time um the trout program we had in my personal opinion i was like man why we throw these trout in these creeks they go out there and catch them Mm-hmm. and they're gone why, why aren't we stocking them and, and letting them reproduce and all this kind of stuff so finally at some point in time somebody had the foresight to have a meeting with us the wildlife guys mm-hmm. and say okay this is why we do our trout program so mm-hmm. that that particular time period they were spending three million dollars a year on a trout program however the the associated revenue from mm-hmm. all the different taxes and the people spending money to mm-hmm. where the trout were they were making over 10 million dollars oh, so wow. any it don't take a rocket scientist yeah. that's a pretty good investment <laughs> so the state was you know a lot of people were making money because mm-hmm. they were stocking trout mm-hmm. and the same thing with fishing uh locally sure. uh fishing is a driving factor for many businesses or local economy mm-hmm. you know you go fill your boat gas or your boat up with gas we all know how that cost you mm-hmm. know and oh, yeah. there's excise taxes placed on certain certain mm-hmm. goods uh sporting goods and so forth some of that goes back to the mm-hmm. fisheries which is wonderful yeah you know? exactly that's good yeah. well a uh, few minutes we've got left here uh let's talk a little bit about um i know i know one of the things that you sort of have a reputation for is being super helpful and being able to to help people um, get started in fishing, like know maybe where to go, how to target different fish. And, you know, one of the questions that keeps coming up is we've got a lot of folks that don't, okay, they don't have boats, they don't have live scope, and they just want a spot to go, you know, bank fish with their kids, you know, soak a minnow or worm or whatever. And uh, one of the things I've noticed is that, uh, I mean, you seem to be pretty helpful in that department, helping people um, with that. And so I didn't know if you want to talk about that a little bit as far as, um, you know, how, how and why you try to help people. Yeah. And then if you want to share anything right. specific. Well, what I found as a law enforcement officer, a game warden, um, you know, I come in contact with people out in the outdoors. And with in society nowadays, especially, there's more and more single parents, whether you're man, men or, or women, and they have kids and they're trying, they want to take their kids out and do something fun. Cheap, fishing can be cheap, you know. It we, can be. We, you, a stick and a string and a hook and a worm. <laughs> right. You know, I've used it myself when I was a kid. Sure. But unfortunately, there's a lot, a lot of people in our community that does not have grandpa, does not have dad or mom or uncle that can take them and show them these things. And they have a desire, but they don't sure. have the the knowledge to do it. And I can't tell you how many fishing hooks I tied as a law enforcement officer mm-hmm. because a person didn't know how to tie a hook. They tied mm-hmm. it like you tie your shoes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or, or they, mm-hmm. you know, used a cork with a rooster tail and sitting there watching the, the cork mm-hmm. because they didn't know no better. Right. So I, I found that we, we did a lot of education programs with the Wild Commission, Fish for Fun events, getting the public out. And I, I seen there was a, a definite need of people that are willing to share information. I don't tell everything. Contrary to some of your, some <laughs> folks that, that think I tell everything, I don't tell everything. However, I, I do know that there's, and I, I'm not making money, I, I, I'm not a fishing guide. I get requests every few days how much do you charge do you charter i always refer them to licensed professional guides in our area that i know mm-hmm. are reputable mm-hmm. that i would send my mama with you right. know that's the people i send them to okay. and um but i will i take a lot of people fishing i don't take everybody uh but i take a lot of people fishing and the goal is not to show them how great a fisherman tony sharon might be because there's a lot of people way better than me however over the course of my life, I'm 57 years old now. Mm-hmm. I fished since I was a little kid, mm-hmm. and I do okay. But I don't mind showing you know mm-hmm. someone how I do it, mm-hmm. and maybe it, you know at some point in this world we're all going to leave here, mm-hmm. and all that stuff you learn throughout your life, if you keep it to yourself, mm-hmm. it's gone with you. It's gone. Right. But hopefully by Mm-hmm. You given this, you know, whether you want to call it wisdom, experience, or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I 
pass a little bit more of the knowledge that I've learned mm -hmm. that hopefully will help them. And it may be a spot, it may be a technique. Um, some of the things that I learned through fishing was specifically because somebody took the time to show me how to do it. I knew how to fish, mm -hmm. but I wasn't doing it exactly right. And mm -hmm. it was a twist to what I needed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And that makes a difference. We have a tremendous amount of people from all over the world in our area, whether they're Hispanic or African or Ukrainian. I mean, there's our, our ethnic diversity in, in our area is just tremendous. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of people that really enjoy being outdoors. In their mm -hmm. home countries, they did that. Mm -hmm. And to get an average person to tell someone from somewhere else that's not like them where to go mm -hmm. fishing, right. a lot of them aren't going to do that. Mm -hmm. And I will take the time and because there's good people across the board. Mm -hmm. And there's bad people, too. Sure. And then and bad people come in all colors, shapes, and sizes. They do, <laughs> just like just like good people do. Sure. But uh, so I take the time. Uh, I really like to to focus on people that are trying to learn. Mm -hmm. If you're an ex, you know experienced fisherman, uh, you're probably not going to learn that great that much from me. But if you're starting out or something, I might have some mm -hmm. helpful hints to give you. And that's sort of where my page started. Mm -hmm. um, I did the page just to sort of give information. I, I think mm -hmm. I did it right before I, I retired. And uh, then over time, I you know, the bank fishing, like our area around High Rock and Tuckertown Lakes, there's a tremendous amount of public mm -hmm. op opportunity where you mm -hmm. can walk and go fishing. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots and lots of places where if you're at Lake Norman, there's probably no place you can do that. Mm -hmm. But on the Yakin River, especially High Rock and especially Tuckertown Lake, there's just mm -hmm many many places that you can walk to mm -hmm. and that a public land that's not an issue and and it has good fishing opportunities mm -hmm. so i try to promote those areas tell people where they can go the right time of year to go uh and it seems to be very helpful mm -hmm. and popular with people right so uh, well having said that uh, just the so the page is talking about and i think most of it, if you're watching this you probably already know tony's page but it's called the shadinator so just think like Terminator, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> Terminator, all the you know that. But think, but put Shad in there, Shad and Ader. Uh, if you don't follow him on Facebook, I'd encourage you to go do that because uh, you know Tony's really good about sharing. Um, you know, just you know, High Rock Tucker Town, what's biting, uh, water clarity, water level. I mean, he's out. I mean, you're out on the lake, what every day or two? well, uh, three or four times a week. I mean, yeah. So you yeah. just you know get a lot of people. You know, I see them online. They're like, well, what's High Rock Lake look like? Or you know, what's the, how dirty is the water? And you just gotta go check out the Shad Nader page, and he's yeah. gonna tell you all about it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I uh, a friend come up with that name. I used to use. I still use Shad a lot for bait. Uh -huh. And we were. I had a boat. I just got a boat. And I said, man, I need to name my boat. And he was like, well, man, you're like the fish terminator. I said, well, yeah, that's sort of good. <laughs> he said, well, you do like to use Shad a lot. He said, the Shadinator. I said, you know, I like that. So that's where it come from. So, uh, yeah, you can hit me up on, on Facebook. Uh, I, I try to respond to messages uh, mm -hmm. as soon as I get them. And, you know, if I can be helpful, I don't mind a bit uh, trying to give you some good advice or where, mm -hmm. where I know. It's firsthand information most of the time that I'm giving you. I've seen it happening. So, you mm -hmm. know, it's not, well, I heard my cousin's brother's second wife's <laughs> first cousin say it. Former roommate. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, what I was just going to ask you is, um, is if you could say anything or anything that you just wanted to communicate to our listening audience or viewing audience, because we actually, by the way, just throw this in there. So what we're recording here with the Brilliant Fishing Podcast, uh, you can see it on YouTube. Um, and I think that's where probably where most of our listeners are coming from. But you can also listen to it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Uh, Podbean and some of those other locations, but um, but if there's anything that you would like to share, maybe I haven't already set you up to say. Like if you just wanted to communicate anything to the, okay. you know, because okay. most people are going to be watching this, they're going to be right. local, right. probably. Well, you know, be kind to people. <laughs> you know, be kind, man. Unfortunately, I, I just I see oftentimes so many people that are. Uh, not thoughtful of other folks when they're out fishing. Uh, you know, it's all about them. Uh, think about it when you were a beginner fisherman. If somebody hadn't taken time mm -hmm. to be patient with you or mm -hmm. try to help you, you know, some people don't want no help, and that's okay. But majority of people 
you know, want to be friendly. And, you know, I see, I seen it a lot when I worked, but obviously when I'm standing there in a uniform, people act a lot different than when you're, <laughs> when you're the old, old guy fishing. Mm-hmm. And I, I still see things that happen sometimes that is just sad. So mm-hmm. be nice, be kind to people. And, uh, you know, there's there's a lot. There, we can't catch all these fish. I just tell you that right now. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you, I go out and I put a sore mouth on a bunch of them, and they're still there. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, conservation is great. Practice conservation. Uh, mm-hmm. If you're not going to eat it, don't waste it. Uh, if you're not going to take it home and eat it, throw it back. However, the regulations are designed to take fish home, mm-hmm. and uh, so. Um, you know, it's, I do not uh, fault anyone that takes a cooler full of fish home if it's legal. If it's not legal, then I hope the game warden catches you. <laughs> right. I'll call him if I see you doing it. But if it's legal and you want to take that fish home, you shouldn't have to hide it under the bag because you're afraid somebody's going to see right. you. Yeah, you shouldn't, take that. Feel, yeah, you shouldn't feel guilty yeah, exactly. about it because the regulations and the rules are designed mm-hmm. to remove predators from the water because if you get too many, then there's exactly. a problem and everything impacts something else this mm-hmm. big fish is eating something mm-hmm. and i found i found blue cats on high rock floating dead more than once that had two different times they had a three pound white bass hung in their throat really a three pound white bass is no, big that's a big one, that's a big one. Yeah. and it choked that's them, a keeper <laughs> and it choked them to death it choked them to death really yes so you know if you remember That's Bass crazy. Pro Shop, they used to have this big catfish flathead uh-huh. in there. And it, one day, one of their big bass got missing. Uh-huh. And it, it was it the eaten. tail was hanging out of the big catfish. They ended up taking the cat, that big catfish oh out because it was eating six pound largemouth. Oh my goodness. So everything likes to eat. So, you know, do your yeah. part, be responsible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, if you want to take fish home and eat them, then do it, but mm-hmm. do it responsibly. Mm-hmm. Good. Well, it's been a pleasure to have Tony with us today, the Shadnator, uh, to share with us and give us some tips, tricks, and hints for springtime fishing on the Yadkin chain. Uh, if you want to reach out to Tony, I'll link his page below. If you're watching on YouTube, I'll link the to the Shadnator below. Um, if he can help you with fishing information, as he said, just reach out to him via Facebook. Um, again, I'm Jason Brilliant, and uh, it's been, been a pleasure uh, you know, being here and recording today. Uh, if you need me for anything, my contact information is below. As I mentioned, um, I'm a dad, a husband, a pastor, an angler, kind of mediocre in the angler department. But if I can uh, help you in any way or pray for you about anything, just reach out to me and my contact information is below as well. And so with that being said, brilliant fishing, signing off.